Each year, on the first Sunday of Lent, we read from the Gospels the story of the temptation of Jesus. Matthew one year, Mark the next, and, and Luke on the third. Um, but what I would like to suggest is just stepping back a bit, remembering especially Oscar Wilde, whose advice on temptation was very clear. The only way to get rid of temptation, he said, is to yield to it. So I don't want to yield to it, and I don't want to fight it today, but I want to step back a step to look at the instruments that we bring, not just to temptation, but to all of Christian life. And I want to do that by using just four words that we use in church every Sunday. I believe in God. And I want to reflect briefly on what does it mean to believe in God. I take as encouragement to step back the actions of the early church, where they used Lent as a period of intense instruction into the basics of the Christian faith. And week by week and day by day, that instruction continued, especially for those who were coming into the faith uh, for the first time, who were going to be baptized at Easter, which was that great climax uh, where people had a vigil which went on all night. And in the middle of that vigil, there was baptism, where people were taken and they stripped naked and went down into a baptistry, three steps down and three steps out, and were reclothed in white as a sign that they had passed from darkness into light, that they had passed from death into life. And it was that fundamental break, uh, that instruction that permeated them as they moved out to enter more deeply into living as Christians. So I believe in God. What does that mean? I believe in ghosts. Um, I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. I believe in UFOs. Or if you have a sense of humor, you'll see, remember Robin Williams doing I believe uh, with Jonathan Winters. It's a wonderful little sketch. Uh, but what does that mean? How does that help us when we're getting up and repeating Sunday after Sunday, I believe in God? What are we talking about? We're talking about something that's really uh, very simple. We're talking about something that we find right through Scripture. And I'd like just to use a couple of in a couple of examples of what it meant to believe, where Jesus himself asks people, do you believe? Is he just being insecure and wants people to say, yeah, I, I really believe in you, and he got, goes off feeling uh, much better? The two people that I would like to focus on is the blind man in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. It's a long story of a man who was born blind and Jesus is passing and he asks him, will you heal me? And uh, Jesus takes uh, clay and puts it on his eyes and, and he's, he's told to go off to the pool of Siloam where he goes and washes and when he comes out, he comes back and says, I can see. And all of the people said, what's going on? Is this really the person that was blind that used to sit there and beg? And he assured them it was. And then the debate goes all the way through with the Pharisees and everybody else getting involved until he's sort of on the margin of things. We've even gone to his parents to say, is this your son? Uh, and Jesus, hearing about it, comes to him. He comes to him and says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he says, well, I don't know who the Son of Man is. And Jesus said, it's me. He said, yes, I believe. What we're seeing here is a belief, a commitment, not to a set of philosophical propositions or theological propositions, 
I believe that he's one substance with the Father through whom all things were made, etc. It's something much more simple than that. It's relational. Do you believe? Do you trust? Do you trust me? And the man says, yes. The second one is that wonderful story when Jesus comes down from the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. He is being transfigured on the mountain and he goes down the mountain into the crowds which are pressing around and angry and hopeful and everything else is going on into all of the mess. And when he comes down, there is a child who has, suffers from spasms, epilepsy perhaps we might call it, uh, and the crowd is pressing in and the man, the father, is asking the, the disciples, can you heal my son? And eventually as Jesus comes down, he is drawn in. And this little kid, maybe six years old, with the crowd and the pressure coming around him, has another spasm and falls on the ground. And you see that wonderful story emerging with Jesus on his knees in the dirt with a father, with the crowds milling around and shouting and pressing in. And Jesus asks the man, do you believe that I can heal? And the man said, I believe, and in magnificent honesty says, but help my unbelief. When you see these two stories, when we're talking about belief, we're talking about relationship, connection, and trust. Jesus is saying, do you trust me? Can you trust me? And again, he's not doing this out of insecurity. But he says simply, can you trust me? And that's the question that Lent and the Gospel and the Creed every Sunday asks. Do you believe, do you trust in God? Now, why is that important for us to trust? Why is it so important that we have to trust in God? And the answer is, uh, is, is disturbing and exhilarating and certainly interesting. Why do we have to trust? And the answer is simply, God himself cannot work with his people, with us as individuals in the world, unless we trust him. How do I know that? Because, very simply, you see it there in Mark's Gospel. Um, we're in Mark, Mark chapter 6. Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, among their own kin, and in their own houses. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. This is Jesus coming back home. He has been doing miraculous deeds all over the country. But when he comes home, we say, what are you talking about? You're Joseph's son. And Jesus could do nothing or very little because the people did not trust him. This is a little bit disturbing for us because we're asking God in our lives and in churches to do all kinds of things. But he cannot do it without you. He cannot do it without me. Do you trust? We create the climate of trust in God. We don't have all the answers. We don't know what the future holds. But can you simply trust in God? In the end, it will come to us because we will all, our lives come to an end, and if we're given a little time for amendment of life, maybe we'll be able to, to say, as with the confidence of Christ, uh, into your hands, O oh God, I commend my spirit. That's a question that recurs and matures in us. Do you, do you trust? Can you say into 
your hands, God. I commend my spirit. I commend my sick son. I commend my blind son. It's an appeal for us to trust. This week we lost a very close, certainly friend of mine, and I know increasingly a friend of yours, Tom Fitches, our organist, who died this week. And Tom was a man who was not a preacher, but he was an extremely gifted and deeply committed musician, never better than when he was accompanying hymns, which he could get into and so evocatively and release the power of them. And he did that for many, many years. He was at St. Clement's for 40 years as the organist. And um, I don't often be personal when I preach, but when I phoned my two daughters, one in England and one here, and said, you know, Mr. Fitches has died, the reaction, their voices cracked. And one of them said, Mr. Fitches was such a big part of my childhood and growing up because they sang in Mr. Fitch's choir. He had 40 odd kids in the choir. He had no ability to control kids or anything else. Uh, but when people saw what he was doing, the parents would come for choir practice on a Thursday at four o'clock and they brought food and fed them, got them pumped up and kept them disciplined. Um, but that was the contribution that he made. He made it through his music. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me to thy bosom fly. Uh, he played that. He spoke that. He believed that. He knew he was ill, and I believe deeply that he was able to say, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. 